Welcome to Fix It Home Improvement, covering projects that every homeowner should know and great products for home and garden. Hi, I'm JC, and this is where we share weekly home improvement tips. I'm here with my co-host, Cindy. Hello, JC. Hi, Cindy. Today, we're going to be talking about chainsaws, and we'd like to thank Duke Sawyer for liking and sharing the podcast. And we are now on CastBox. It's our podcast? Our podcast, C-A-S-T-B-O-X. If you are looking for a good Android app mm-hmm. for podcasts, it really does a nice job. What I like a couple things about it. One, is it has a sleep timer. So if you're falling asleep to a podcast, it'll, our podcast. It'll, it, it'll automatically shut off. And then it has some great categories. So it has a category for audiobooks. Hmm. And so if you search for audiobooks, it has a bunch of different categories where it has science fiction or science. Just pretty amazing. And some of these, I, I was looking at a couple of the science fiction mm-hmm. books, 10 hours long. Nice. And free. <laughs> In the 1830s, a German physician created a hand crank bone cutting saw that had a rotating chain on it, so very similar to a modern chainsaw. Mm. In the 1920s, steel made one of the first chainsaws. It took two men to operate it. It was electric and it weighed over 100 pounds. In 1950, steel made one of the first single person gas chainsaws. And then in 1973, Husqvarna created the auto chain brake. So this is a lever that stops the chain if it were to kick back towards the user. Yeah. So a chainsaw has a chain similar to a bike chain, and it's revolving around a guide bar that has a groove all along the edge. Mm -hmm. And you have these drive links. So it has a piece of metal that drops down into that groove that's holding the chain in place, and then that drive link is also catching on the sprocket and being driven by the engine. Okay. There's also going to be cutting blades. Sometimes they call them cutting teeth spaced along the chain, and that's what's doing the cutting. Mm-hmm. And this is all held together with tie straps and rivets. And because of the friction and the heat and the stress put on the chain, you have to use a bar oil pumped into that groove, either manually or automatically. And the chain is really an interesting design. So it's designed to suck up that oil so it goes to the rivets and the links to keep it lubricated. So it's called bar oil? Bar, so B-A-R oil, and it's a special blend. It's stickier than a standard motor oil, so it stays in place, and it just doesn't get flung off, <laughs> even, even though some does get flung off. <laughs> there are three types of chainsaws, gas, corded electric, and cordless electric. The gas chainsaws are going to be the most powerful. You have good mobility. Most are going to be two-cycle, so you have to mix a two-cycle oil into your gas before filling the saw, And what's becoming more popular in hardware stores, if you're just using your chainsaw occasionally, are these pre-mixed bottles. So they have chainsaw fuel and oil already mixed together. Chainsaw fuel? Right. So you mean like gasoline? (laughs) Yes. So gas and oil, a lot of them have a stabilizer in there too. So the two-cycle oil is different from the bar oil? Yes. So gas chainsaws, they're going to range from light duty to professional grade, and gas is a good choice. If you're cutting down trees or large branches, they're going to be a little heavier than electric, and you're going to have more maintenance. You're going to have to buy gas and oil, and then the store it. The chainsaw fuel? <laughs> the special <laughs> chainsaw <laughs> gasoline, and then store it in the off-season. Electric chainsaws are good for light work around the house, cutting firewood, trimming trees, and corded models are going to be easy to start. They're lightweight, they're quieter than gas, you're going to have less maintenance. The key thing is you want to match the extension cord to the amps on your chainsaw, and the chainsaws are going to range from 8 to 15 amps. You want an outdoor rated grounded extension cord, and you want to make sure you match it, because if you use an underrated cord, the motor's never going to get up to speed, and it's going to shorten the life of your saw. So a 100-foot 16-gauge cord is going to pull 10 amps, 100-foot 14-gauge cord, 13 amps, and a 100-foot 12-gauge cord, 15 amps. Mm-hmm. What's crazy about electric chainsaws is most of the pros are saying they're safer for inexperienced users. Why? But uh, Because they're lightweight, they're a little easier to control. But most electric chainsaws will cut through safety chaps. Chaps? Like what? Pants? Well, uh, like they protect your pants like chaps, like what a cowboy would wear, you know, to protect his legs while he's running through the forest. So are you recommending that you wear chaps when you're using a chainsaw? Yes, well, chainsaw chaps, they're specialized safety chaps. So, but but the key thing I'm trying to get here is if you have a gas chainsaw, which is which is the most powerful, right? 
they'll be stopped by these safety chainsaw chaps, whereas if you have an electric corded chainsaw, most of them, because they're, they're such high torque, they'll actually cut through safety chaps. That's so not so safe. Right, exactly. Hmm. So how is that safer? <laughs> it's not. That's so, and that's, so that's the point. So that's what's interesting is most pros are saying electric chainsaws are probably better for inexperienced users. But if you're an inexperienced, but you'll cut through your pants. If you're an inexperienced user and you're using a gas chainsaw and you're wearing the proper safety gear, it's actually safer, <laughs> in my opinion. <laughs> Cordless chainsaws are going to give you more mobility than corded saws, but you're limited by the battery life and the amount of batteries you have. Cordless batteries, you need to keep them charged and in moderate temperatures when you're not using them for the longest life. The recommended bar length for your chainsaw is going to vary by company, but in general, heavy-duty saws are 18 to 20 inches long, medium-duty 16 to 18 inches, and light-duty 8 to 16 inches. So what's recommended and for homeowners? So for most homeowners, if you're not doing a lot of, you know, large, cutting down large trees, 16 inches or around 16 inches is what's recommended. Hmm. And for the safest cutting, you, your bar should be two inches longer than the wood you're cutting through because you never want to get the tip of the chain caught on wood, which can cause a kickback. So kick so like when you're cutting, you're using like the middle of the saw? Yeah, the middle, middle and the end towards the motor, towards the okay. back of it, not the tip. Hmm. If the tip or the top portion at the end comes in contact with something solid, that chainsaw is going to dig in and then it explosively goes in reverse. Mm. It kicks back and up faster than you can react. So I it don't think I'd want to use a chainsaw. Yeah, they're one of the most dangerous things mm -hmm. that a homeowner is going to use. More than a quarter of all accidents from kickback are injuries to the neck, shoulder, face, and hand. Mm -hmm. And about a quarter of the other injuries are to your legs and knees. The U.S. Consumer Product Safety Commission estimates about 30,000 injuries a year from chainsaws. Wow. You can get reduced kickback chains that have guard links to reduce the depth that the cutting teeth are digging into the wood. Okay. So that's going to give you more control, less chance of a kickback. And then there's chain with less aggressive cutting angles on the teeth. That's also better for less kickback. You have safety bars with a smaller nose or the end of that bar is going to be reduced so there's less chance of kickback. And you also want a chainsaw with kickback brake, or it's called a chain brake. So this is part of the front hand guard. This is set in front of the top handle. And when it's pushed forward, it's going to stop the motion of the chain. Hmm. So if your saw kicks up and back towards you, it forces your hand and wrist to push this brake forward, and it stops the chain in a fraction of a second. Oh, nice. The chain brake can also be used to hold the chain in place when you're sharpening. And some models have an inertia chain brake. So this is triggered when the bar is forced up quickly. So I borrowed your dad's electric chainsaw. I know. It doesn't have a chain brake. <laughs> have you used it yet? No. It doesn't have a chain brake. <laughs> some chainsaws come with a tip protector. So this is a metal bar or a plate that's covering the tip and that top part of the bar at the very end. Mm -hmm. And it's going to help prevent kickback. And this is great for users with less experience. It's going to limit the cutting area slightly, but it's going to be much safer, especially if you're cutting up with the sauce or using the top part of the bar or the top chain mm -hmm. to cut with. Are you supposed to cut up or down? You can, it's designed to cut both ways. Cutting down is going to be the safest, but in some situations you're going to need to cut with an upward motion. Mm. Some other features to look for on gas chainsaws. Easy start models are either going to have a spring to help turn over the engine or an opening to allow more air into the cylinder to reduce compression. It's mm -hmm. going to be easier to start. A tool-free chain tensioner. So rather than using a wrench and a screwdriver to tighten the chain, it makes it much easier. Because it's tool-free? Exactly. <laughs> Anti-vibration or low vibration is going to prevent hand damage, or at least it's going to help prevent hand damage. We talked about Renaud's syndrome. Oh, you I know, looked for, that up. For your fingers. Yeah, just mm. terrible. A fuel level indicator is nice. An on-off switch or a safety kill switch will allow you to stop the engine if there's a problem with, let's say, the chain is moving while it's in idle. You can just turn it off. An air pre-cleaner. This is going to help keep the air filter clean so large particles get knocked out before they get to the filter. Hmm. A primer bulb is going to make a gas chainsaw easier to start. 
a safety throttle. So this is a switch that has to be depressed before the engine trigger will work. So mm -hmm. you can't just randomly turn it on. Or if you lose control, this is nice because if you lose your grip, it's going to stop the chain. Okay, a what cha about the people that like juggle chainsaws? Those aren't real chainsaws. <laughs> They're what? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it might be a real chainsaw, but I'm guessing that it's not real sharp. I mean, I don't know for sure. Uh, right, but I mean, but they're I'm, going. But I'm, but I'm, yeah, it's like magic. It's not <laughs> real. A chain catcher is another nice thing to have. So this is a metal hook that catches the chain if it breaks or derails. It's going to mm -hmm. help prevent injury. A spark arrester in the muffler. This is going to prevent sparks from coming out of the exhaust, and this is required in many parts of the country. And you should check this routinely to make sure it's not clogged because your, your chainsaw isn't going to work as well. Mm -hmm. And when you're comparing models, a chain bar cover, or it's called a scabbard, is going to protect the saw chain. Mm -hmm. And it's also going to help protect against injury because they're very sharp. Even when the chain's not moving, right. they're very sharp. And a carrying case is very convenient. Some are going to come with a plastic box and a mm -hmm. scabbard and have a handle on top. So very easy to transport. Well, when we were comparing models, a lot of them come really, with really nice cases now. Yeah. I spoke to Ryobi, and they gave Ryobi? these... Ryobi? Don't we normally call it Ryobi? <laughs> it used to. That was one of the first <laughs> things they trained me on. Okay, here's how we pronounce our company's name. It's Ryobi. So it's R-Y-O-B-I, and we always called it Ryobi. And everybody I know, I know call it Ryobi. It's right. just like... It's like Vibram soles that you put, you know, so like the Vibram lug soles on work boots. Ugh, we just it, did a video on this. It's actually called Vibram. Hmm. Crazy, huh? Yeah. So some of the tips I got from Ryobi, chainsaws are designed for two-hand operation only. And if you're left-handed, people need to use it as a right-handed, or you need to use it right-handed for the safest operation. You Why? all. Well, in fact, one thing that they taught me was when you hold it, you don't want to be in line with the blade. So you want your body offset slightly. If you do get kicked back, if it's coming straight up, you want it to the side of you. Hmm. So you don't want your head and the center of your body lined up over it. You want to kind of stand to the side. So if your right hand is gripping the back handle where the trigger is, you want it to extend straight out from your right hand so it's not lined up with your face. You always want to have a fire extinguisher available, and for wood, you're looking for a Class A fire extinguisher. Turn it off before setting it on the ground. Do not operate it in a tree or on a ladder. Do not use it to cut vines or small underbrush because hmm. it'll get tangled and it can pull you off balance, which I never thought of or knew. They always suggest using a safety tip or an anti-kick guard on the end of it to mm -hmm. prevent kickback and also help prevent touching any objects that you don't want it to touch. Never use E15 or E85 fuel. Two-cycle engines, they recommend a 50 to 1 mix with two-cycle oil. And add a fuel stabilizer like stable. You want to adjust the bar and chain screw only when the engine is off. And only start the chainsaw from the ground. And you don't want to allow the chain to touch the ground. So what? Like, if you see some of the pros start it, they'll be holding it, like, let's say, up high with their left hand and they'll kind of drop it and pull with the right hand to start it. It's kind of a it's it's kind of a cool looking motion, but they say it's very That's dangerous. Not right. It's, well, it's not right for inexperienced users. So, so start it on the ground? Yeah, you want it setting on the ground. Well, in fact, to start So a, like the motor setting on the ground. R right. Yeah, the unit itself is setting on the ground. The bar is straight out and not touching anything. Okay. And you're actually going to most of them are designed the gas so that you can stand. There's a little plate that you can stand on where the trigger is, oh. and you're going to stand on that, and then you're going to pull the cord to get it started. Okay. When you're replacing your chain on your chainsaw, not all 16-inch chains are the same or interchangeable or whatever your length is. You need to know three things. So you need to know the gauge, which is the thickness. You need to know the chain pitch and the number of drive lengths. So for the thickness or the gauge, it's going to either be stamped on the drive links or you're going to have to use calipers to find the size. Okay. You know a quarter is 0.063. No, why would I know that? A penny is 0.0558 and a dime is 0.050. Mm. To measure the pitch, you're going to measure the distance between three rivets center to center and then you're going to divide by two. And a common size for homeowners is three eighths of an inch. You also need to count the number of drive links so this is the link that has, it almost looks like a shark's fin that's turned upside down. And that's the piece that's going down into the bar, okay. into that groove. So you just need to count those. Okay. And that's how you're going to decide which chain you need. 
When you're looking at chain, you're also going to see cutter types or teeth types and chain sequence. For the cutter teeth, there's other terms, but you have low profile, which is like a safety chain, really good for homeowners. You have a full chisel, so this is a square tooth that really takes a nice hunk out of the wood. Mm -hmm. This is mainly for the pros. Semi-chisel has rounded corners, so there's a little less kickback, and this would be used for some homeowner models and professional. You also have chipper chain, which is a semi-chisel. Some other terms, you're going to see round or semi-chisel. You know, they might be one or the other. With the chain sequence, you have standard semi-skip and full skip or skip tooth, some companies call it. So the standard has less distance between the cutters, and that's also going to give you more control. So shorter or medium length bars are going to have a standard spacing or okay. a sequence. Semi-skip and full skip, you have more distance between the cutter teeth, and it's a little harder to control. You're going to have a little more vibration, but this is for your longer bars. It gives a deeper cut, so mm. the pros like it. With the safety chain, you're going to see bumper drive links, so it limits the depth that it cuts into wood. You're going to see bumper tie strap or ramped depth gauge or wide track depth gauge. These are all terms for safety chain. And you should really look at your manual because some, some bars will only accept a certain type okay. depending on the manufacturer. In general, if you see a, la a yellow label on the chain or the bar, it's for pros. The green labels on the bar and the chain are going to be your low kickback. Okay. Before you put the new chain on, take the bar off and clean the oil holes and clean that groove real well. And make sure the chain is in the right direction. So the chain on the top of the bar, that cutting edge, should be facing away from the motor. And as it comes down underneath on the bottom of the bar, the cutting part of the teeth should be toward the motor. Okay. You need to break in a new chain. So a, a lot of pros recommended taking your new chain Put it in a disposable pan, like those aluminum disposable oven pans. Okay. Pour bar oil over it and let it set for about an hour so the oil is allowed to get in between all the metal parts. Hmm. Install your chain and tighten it. Just run it for a few minutes till the bar and the chain is warm, and then retension it so you have the right tension on it. You want to run it again, just cutting small branches for around 15 minutes, and then retension it, and then you're ready for heavy loads. You also want to adjust the idle speed, so the chain shouldn't be moving when it's at idle. Mm -hmm. You have a centrifugal clutch, which is spring-loaded, so this will expand at high speed and engage the drum, the sprocket, to move your chain, and then at idle, or when you release the trigger, it disengages. Mm. And if you're just starting to use a chainsaw, when you're cutting down using the bottom of the bar, the chainsaw is going to want to move forward, so you almost have to slightly pull backward. You really have to have a good grip on this when you're using it. When you're cutting up and you're using the top of the bar, the chainsaw wants to move backward, so you're going to have to push forward. Hmm. Bar oil is designed to stick to the chain and the bar and lubricate the rivets and reduce friction between the chain and the bar. And it's not a standard motor oil, and you should only use a bar oil for the bar and chain. It's going to come in a summer and a winter weight, and if you're using this year long, you should really have both, okay. but check your manual, see what they recommend. Some bar oils are designed to keep sap and debris from sticking. Mm -hmm. The oil is stored in a reservoir and can be applied manually before each cut with a push control mm -hmm. or automatically, which is a lot more convenient. <laughs> If you have the correct weight oil, a thin line of oil should shoot off the end of the chain while you're using it, which, which is interesting. So an alternative to petroleum-based bar oil is a vegetable oil made for chainsaws, hmm. so much better for the environment and wildlife. And in Germany now, professionals have to use a biodegradable bar oil. Hmm. What's interesting about most chainsaws is they're configured from the factory to work below 2,000 feet in altitude. Hmm. If you're working with a chainsaw and you're in an area where it's above 2,000 feet, it can cause irreversible damage if you don't have it recalibrated. That's crazy. <laughs> when you're using a chainsaw, you should always wear safety equipment. So leg protection, which is going to be chainsaw chaps or cut-resistant pants, a hard hat with earmuffs and a visor, and anytime you're using any tools over 85 decibels, you want hearing protection, mm -hmm. goggles, cut-resistant gloves with enhanced grip, so they're tacky, and steel-toed work boots with non-slip soles. 
Chainsaw chaps have multiple layers of Kevlar, so bulletproof vest material. Mm -hmm. And then they have an outer layer of nylon or a similar material that's filled with a ballistic fiber. So when the chainsaw hits the outer layer of these chaps, that fiber expands and it clogs the chain so it stops it very quickly. And then the layers of Kevlar protect you from getting cut. Mm. So most electric chainsaws will not be stopped by the ballistic fiber. Why not? Because so, we said that earlier. Right, right, which is, is really interesting. So Le Bonville was one of the first to develop safety chaps, and it's L-A-B-O-N-V-I-L-L-E. And they've got a really interesting YouTube video showing how they work. Hmm. So, you know, they, they apply it to it. And you know Ronald Reagan? Yeah. He, <laughs> he wore Le Bonville's safety chaps when he worked on his farm with chainsaws. Hmm. Some top-rated chainsaw chaps, Le Bonville... Husqvarna, H-U-S-Q-V-A-R-N-A, Steel, S-T-I-H-L, and Forrester. A chainsaw helmet is going to have an integrated earmuff and a visor, and the visor can either be a steel mesh or a full plastic shield. And a lot of the pros are suggesting the mesh because of airflow and it's not going to fog up like the full plastic. Mm -hmm. They're also suggesting wearing goggles along with this to protect against small splinters either going through the mesh or around the plastic. And helmets with ventilation were rated the highest for comfort. Hmm. Some top-rated chainsaw helmets, TR Industrial, Husqvarna, North by Honeywell, Stern, Lebonville, and Steel. Some top-rated chainsaws for gas, Ryobi, Steel, Poulan, so it's P-O-U-L-A-N. And you know a Poulan chainsaw was featured in the original 1974 Texas Chainsaw Massacre. I was wondering if you were going to get to that. And I saw it in 1974 to drive in. Oh, you're old. <laughs> so, Texas Chainsaw Massacre, uh -huh. it only cost them 300000 to make it. Oh, that's it? It grossed $30 million. <laughs> that's not a bad return. <laughs> yeah. Husqvarna, Hitachi, Tanaka, and Jonesred. So it's J-O-N-S-E-R-E-D. So this is a Swedish company. Mm -hmm. And in Sweden, the sun rises at 3.30 a.m. in the summer, and it sets at 3.30 p.m. in the winter. Mm -hmm. For cordless chainsaws, the Ego was rated very high. And for corded electric, works. W-O-R-X. Do you have anything else to add? I would match your saw size to your projects, but the most versatile, probably for the average homeowner, is around a 16-inch bar. I would get something with a safety chain and a safety tip or tip protector mm -hmm. and a chain break. And I don't think there's any overkill with protective gear when you're dealing with a chainsaw because right. it's so dangerous. So I would spend the money for the protective gear if you plan on doing a lot of projects. Mm -hmm. Keep your blades sharp. There's sharpening kits available. Or you can go to your local hardware store. They'll either sharpen it or send it out. Mm -hmm. And then check your maintenance schedule in your manual. Let's wrap this up. You can subscribe to our podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, the Spotify mobile app, the Google Play Music app, iHeartRadio, and CastBox. If you enjoyed it, please leave us a review. You can check out our home improvement videos on our YouTube channel, Fix It Home Improvement. And you can subscribe to that as well. You can download our books, Home Improvement Solutions, What Every Homeowner Should Know, on Amazon. If you enjoyed it, please leave us a five-star rating and review. You can email us at fixitpodcast at gmail.com. Thank you for listening. Talk to you next week.